While in the US, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day with a public holiday on the third Monday of January. India celebrates the man whose ideas helped inspire King's nonviolent philosophy, Mahatma Gandhi. Both MLK Day and Gandhi Jayanti, Gandhi's birthday, respectively serve as an occasion to remember and to discuss the legacy of these respective societal leaders. King's birthday calls to mind race relations in the United States. Uh, Gandhi's legacy is multidimensional. Gandhi's birthday calls to mind Hindu-Muslim relations as well as a broader philosophy that still impacts economics and social policy. Gandhi's goal was not only political independence for the subcontinent. He also fought for economic independence and unity of religious groups, one country where Hindus and Muslims could both thrive. However, this dream did not come to fruition um, as Jinnah and the Muslim League successfully made their case to the British that a separate homeland for South Asia, uh, South Asia's Muslims, was required and the two-state plan was adopted. Holding Gandhi responsible for this breakup, a Hindu nationalist called Nataram Godse assassinated Gandhi on the 30th of January 1948. With Gandhi so closely tied to partition, uh, his birthday calls to mind communal relations in India in the way that race relations are brought to mind on Martin Luther King Day in the United States. But certainly we remember Gandhi today for far more than uh, just these efforts to uh, unite Hindus and Muslims. Economic policy is another key area where Gandhi's legacy looms large. Gandhi's vision for India was one with a weak central government and self-sustaining villages uh, being the actual centre of economic production. This vision ultimately failed to resonate with India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, who, taking up the fashion of the day, uh, believed that Soviet-style state-led industrialisation and five-year central economic plans would be the engine of India's future. Today, those who advocate for decentralisation or movement of power uh, and or resources to more local levels of government, uh, frequently right down to the village level, uh, often described as being Gandhian. Gandhi also stood for self-sufficiency in economic production. Uh, at a time when Indian raw materials like cotton were being sent from the uh, agricultural uh, lands of the country to textile mills in Britain, uh, or even uh, India's big cities, uh, Gandhi advocated for Swadeshi, or self-sufficiency, encouraging millions of Indians not just to buy Indian products, but to actually uh, make them themselves uh, and to buy them from uh, as locally sourced as, as possible. Uh, Gandhi encouraged millions of Indians to spin their own clothes at home uh, rather than buying these foreign-made or, or factory-made uh, products. This is still a very important legacy when examining a debate on foreign investment into India, for example, um, or uh, the growth of factory-led mass production um, and industrialization. The context of Gandhi and this Swadeshi um, uh, philosophy uh, is key to understanding some of the Indian perspectives involved in those debates. Even the name Gandhi himself is politically important. You might be familiar with the names Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi. Uh, whilst all related to one another, uh, Indira Gandhi uh, is the mother of Rajiv Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi is Rajiv Gandhi's wife and both uh, Rajiv and Indira were prime ministers. And Sonia Gandhi, uh, as the chairman of the Indian Congress party, was responsible for the electoral success uh, or seen by many to be responsible for it, and, and basically is the power behind the Congress party. And her son, Rahul Gandhi, uh, was their candidate at the last election, or, the, or the, the principal spokesman of the Congress party, and is seen as very much the heir apparent of Congress. Um, now, in fact, none of these politicians called Gandhi are actually related to Mohandas K. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, rather, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's daughter, Indira, uh, married a man whose name was Gandhi and that therefore has undoubtedly helped continue associations of the what is in fact the Nehru political dynasty uh, with Mahatma Gandhi. 
Gandhi's significance to India is, is very, very deep. Um, you frequently see his statue uh, across the country, uh, his image uh, on posters in, in buildings. Um, there's a fantastic um, piece of street art on the side of the Delhi police headquarters, uh, for example. Uh, and many Indian cities even have uh, MG roads, Mahatma Gandhi roads, most famously um, the main road or one of the main roads going through the centre of Bangalore. Ironically, for a man who shunned money um, as much as Gandhi did, uh, Mahatma Gandhi now looks out of the Indian currency. He is featured on uh, the front side of uh, the Indian notes uh, and lives in fact on both sides of the 500 rupee note. Uh, the reverse depicts his famous dandy march uh, to protest against the British salt tax uh, by making his own salt um, on the coast of his home state of Gujarat. Um, he led a group of people down to the coast, uh, to the village of Dandi, uh, where they uh, panned for salt as a way of, of protesting. Uh, the British had been taxing salt, actually, for hundreds of years. Uh, it's the one item that everyone needs to have in their diet, uh, even if they're self-sufficient in terms of food production or in terms of uh, water. Uh, the ultimate regressive tax, in fact, uh, which, of course, uh, hurt India's poorest the most. Um, before we move on to our third and final civic holiday, uh, which is India's Republic Day, um, let me tell you a short story that combines both borders and salt. This is one of the, uh, well, it's one of the most extraordinary and shocking uh, things that I've uh, ever learned during my time in India. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, um, to help enforce their salt tax and to avoid people smuggling salt from the western parts of the country, uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat, to the eastern parts of the country, uh, where it was in Bihar and Bengal, where it was in the highest demand. Um, the British built a 2,500 mile long impenetrable hedge. Uh, it was 12 foot tall um, and it literally divided India in two, from the Khyber Pass right up in, in the northwest, all the way down through to the Bay of Bengal. This uh, hedge was in place for about 30 years. Every few miles um, there would be checkpoints so that people would cross from uh, one, side, one side of the country, in effect, to the other. Um, and after being checked for salt and um, much else besides. Uh, imagine how this divided communities, how humiliating it must have been and how difficult uh, it must have made ordinary people's lives uh, living on either side of this hedge, all to enforce a tax which hurt the poorest the hardest. Now, for many years, the British commissioner uh, who was responsible for this project, um, which was officially called the Inland Customs Line, uh, was a British gentleman by the name of Alan Octavian Hume. Uh, he actually goes on to become one of the founders of the Indian National Congress Party, uh, which campaigned for uh, 70, 80 years for Indian independence and then became the ruling party for much of the last 70 years. First under Gerald Nero, then Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, and most recently Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Amazingly, the great hedge of India was actually, this, this whole story that I've just told you, was forgotten for over 100 years uh, until the late 1990s uh, when a researcher by the name of uh, Roy Moxham, living in London, uh, chanced upon a reference to it, uh, which then inspired him to come out to India several times to hunt down uh, the hedge and the stories behind it. Uh, amazingly, he did actually find it and he also found people deep in rural India who uh, knew of its existence. Let's now uh, turn to India's last civic holiday, uh, Republic Day, and consider the importance of India's constitution. 